On today's show... I used to think that I know that God can heal, but I don't know if He wants to. And now I know He wants to. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. It's going to be a great show today. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. We are so fortunate at the 700 Club Canada to witness powerful stories of lives changed by the power of God every single day. Absolutely. And today we have two stories that will simply make you say, wow. Mm -hmm. And you'll see how one young boy with a mysterious digestive illness was miraculously healed and defied the doctors. Mm -hmm. Now, what's your wow story of late, Lori? Man, I got so many wow stories. I gotta yeah. think quick. I gotta yeah, pick wow, one out of the wow, wow, wow. Well, honestly, isn't it a wow every time a, a child is born? Ooh, you know, that's so a wow. I, we had a new another new baby to our family, so that's always a wow. Wow. But you know, I saw a really amazing healing not too long ago, mm -hmm. and it was this gentleman that we prayed with, and he had a crippled hand. And um, I'm not sure all that was going on or yes. how long he had had that situation, but we just prayed over and laid hands on him and he began to move his hand like immediately. And yeah. it's just, I mean, that is simply a wow. Yeah. You know, what about you, Brian? Well, you know what? I'm, I've been preaching on a series, Beyond, and Going Beyond. And I, I brought in a good buddy of mine, uh, Rabbi Jeff Foreman. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about that, that God curses to the third and fourth generation, but blesses to a thousand generations. Right, and yeah. we saw a wow moment uh, just blow the doors really? off. Yeah. And yeah. people were, I mean, testimonies just keep coming in. Oh, that's so good. Maybe yeah. it's birthed some. Lots yeah. of wow, 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 wow. Wow, 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 right. wow. Well, today you'll see another incredible <laughs> story of a couple who survived a fiery plane crash. And we have a wonderful devotional today on gratitude. But first, seconds before the plane went down, Sonia began to pray. And mm. this is what happens when God answers prayer. Cool. Um, when my clothes are burning, my hair. More than anything, that was the moment when I thought, now you're gonna die. August 30th, 2015. Ken McKenzie and his wife, Sonia, were preparing to fly from Fort Lauderdale to Washington, D.C. for the quick stop in Lynchburg, Virginia, to see their daughter, Monica. Ken had over 36 years of flying experience in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and later for commercial airlines in Canada and the U.S. Every flight is gonna have different aspects to it. It's a, it's a different mission. But on this particular day, I think we're probably just more excited to be going to see Monica than anything. I am not quite as comfortable flying and doing adventuresome things as Ken, so there's always just a few butterflies in my stomach. Finally, Ken got clearance to take off. We got to about 3,800 feet when uh, I was doing my internal scan of the instruments and I noticed that the oil pressure was significantly lower than it should be. Uh, oil pressure on the aircraft should be uh, 60 uh, pounds per square inch, and this was actually nine. At once, Ken radioed the tower and turned back toward the airfield. When I heard him say 864 Kilo Mike declaring an emergency, it's like it, a lump just went right here. We were planning as if the engine would fail and hoping that it was just an indication issue and that we would be able to land and find that, oh, some probe was not functioning well. I, d I never really thought this is how we die. I knew I was really, really nervous, but it, we have to come out of it. We're gonna come out of it. I called air traffic control and said, we have the airport visual. And they said, uh, we confirm you have the airport visual, switch to Fort Lauderdale Executive Tower. And I hit the radio uh, button to do that and the engine stopped and things got really quiet. And now he declares a mayday. That's a new level of now of the, the anxiety is, is, is super intense. My first responsibility is to figure out how to get us on the ground safely. Can I make the runway? No. Can we land in the, in the town? Because we're right over Fort Lauderdale, uh, but that's probably not gonna go very well. Very, very fast airplane, and when it touches down, it's really moving fast. It's doing over 100 miles per hour. Ken decided their best option was to try and land on a narrow gravel levee between the edge of town and the Everglades swamp. Ran all the emergency checklists, uh, got everything all ready for the landing. Then we had time to reflect and say, we got a couple minutes here, or seconds. Um, we should pray now. I knew at the time I didn't need to have an eloquent prayer. Dear Father, I'm in this time of need. I, he clearly knew, so I just said, oh God. Ken landed on the levee going over 120 miles per hour, trying to keep control of the aircraft. 
we started bouncing all over the place. Uh, we slowed to about 55 or 60 knots, and the nose starts to drift to the left because as it slows down, I'm starting to lose directional control. We've got this really strong crosswind, and then the left landing gear fell off the top of the levee, and it broke off. And we spun around really quickly, almost to that the wind was knocked out of me. When I looked over Sonia's shoulder to see where we were going, all I saw was flames. And we came to a stop, and now the entire airplane's engulfed in flames. I thought, we might not get out of this alive. I remember being really, really hot, warm, and the screen in front all red. That's when it went through my head, oh, this is how it feels to die in an airplane crash. I stepped out onto the wing, the wing's on fire. The first thing I felt was pain. And it started with my leg. And as I got the rest of my body out, it went to my arm and it went to my, my head and my chest and, and just intense pain, unlike anything I'd ever felt before. He reached for my hand to pull me and I'd forgotten my headset on, and so it, it jerked me back. And our hands slipped and she fell back into the airplane. More than anything, that was the moment when I thought, now you're gonna die because I'm not leaving you behind. So either uh, I'm going to get you out or uh, I'm going to die trying. And then he grabbed my hand and pulled. And up she came out of the seat. Here I am standing on the wing, having burning away. Um, when my clothes are burning, my hair. Um, and when Sonia comes out on the wing, there's a circle around us now of no flames. Then the fire parted, leaving a clear path to the canal. Ken and Sonia jumped into the water and swam away from the burning wreckage. They climbed back onto the levee to wait for help. I started to feel a little bit elated. I think we we're both a little bit elated like we lived and, and we're here. So, so almost an excited feeling. Emergency personnel rushed Ken and Sonia to the hospital. Sonia had minor burns to her head while Ken sustained second and third degree burns over 8% of his body, which required painful cleaning and multiple surgeries. Three weeks later, he was released to go home. That Thanksgiving, the family met at the crash site to remember and to give thanks to God for saving their lives. All I could feel was a sense of foreboding as to what could have happened and a sense of true gratefulness and joy. We gathered in a circle and prayed and thanked God for keeping us alive. And so it was kind of almost more a celebration, being, being happy we made it. The Mackenzies still enjoy flying together and often share their faith in a God who still does miracles. Sharing my faith has become a heck of a lot easier. Fulfill what God's called you to do and actually get out there and do it. We don't want to forget these experiences or, or take them for granted. So we need to share how God has you know, saved us literally and how our faith has, has brought us through and maybe can help somebody else as well. Wow, man, you know, you say that Frontwards, backwards, it's the same. Wow. And that was a big wow moment as well. When you look at Ken, um, he says, and I, and I, and I love it, his statement, he says, it's made uh, sharing my faith a heck of a lot easier now. No kidding. You know, when you see Monica in that plane and you're saying, mm, uh, she's getting ready to die, you're getting ready to die, only thing in your mind is, Lord, uh, I pray that I'm right with you now. <laughs> I mean, that's, that would be my prayer at the moment. But he said, this would be a good time for us to pray because we're going down. I wonder if you've been in that moment, but I want to encourage you today, you might be in that moment at, the, at this very time that you're watching. God can get you out of that moment, answered prayer. You may not know what to pray. Uh, the Bible says that Peter didn't know what to pray either. And in, in Matthew chapter 14, in verse 30, it says that he was sinking when he got out of the boat and he just prayed a very simple prayer, Lord, help, save me. That was probably one of the shortest prayers in the Bible, but Jesus reached out, grabbed him, brought him to safety. If you'll just scream out help right now and then call the number on the screen and request this answered prayer, 1-855-759-0700, I believe that there is a corresponding response to our faith. And if you'll pick up that phone, I believe on the other end of that, you're going to see that the help is there. And Father, I pray in this moment that you would bring peace, but you would also bring protection and deliverance in Jesus' name, amen. Up next, a desperate family gets their miracle and defies doctors in the process. 
don't go away. Adrian was five months and a half. The nurse advised us to start feeding him baby food, just to, to start the transition to solid food and to try out if he could even sleep better. He didn't respond well. He was in a lot of pain. He was screaming all through the night and all through the day. Um, he was sweating profusely. His clothes were soaked and he was spastic from the pain. My husband Thomas and I would take turns comforting him and, and carrying him all through the night. And each one of us could take maximum of, of 30 minutes. Uh, and then we would have to switch. Uh, you try to do everything for him, but you can't take away the pain. When they put him on IV nutrition, within two days he was pain free. And we realized that many of his symptoms were, were related to his digestive system. Through years, we stayed like 80 to 120 days a year in the hospital. He was very sick, so we expected him to die several times. My cries to God were, did you forget us? Are you busy somewhere? I would cry until I had no tears left. And there in the silence afterwards, he would come. We could very much feel his presence. I was upset to God because why? Why should I get a sick son and, uh, and so sick? Of course I was crying out to God and shouting to him. Uh, I think God is big enough to take my expression. His muscles would get weaker and then they would disappear. So he had some kind of progressive muscular disease, although we didn't know what caused it. He had epilepsy, he had tachycardia, he had a lot of problems that caused him to grow very, very weak. And at the age of 11, our doctor said, you've talked about going on a trip, just creating memories for you as a family to live on after he's gone. Now is your window of opportunity. Next year, he probably won't be able to. And we knew next year we might not have him. We couldn't go to the, to the beach because of Adrian. We couldn't play in the sand. We couldn't go to a Disney park because he was too weak to go to everything. And he just had to look at them. And that was not fun for him. And we thought, well, we'd like to go to a conference, like a church conference. And that might sound weird, but we had never been able to go anywhere. But we thought, so what if we go to Bethel Church? Our kids just love their music. When we got to Bethel, Adrian leaned over and he said to me, Mom, now I know that whatever God has for me, that's what I want. I knew he wants the best for me. And that was just great. Um, and then we, we went to a, a breakout session on, on healing. And at the end, they said, does anyone need a miracle? And he raised his hand and a young man stood next to Adrian. And he said, so what's wrong with you? And Adrian said, I can't eat. And he just prayed for Adrian, praying for new life in his stomach and, and his digestive system. And, and off we went. And I asked Adrian, so did you sense anything? Did you feel any different? And I said, no, but it was a good experience. So for lunch, we went to a restaurant nearby because we, we just needed to eat before the next session. And we all ordered and Adrian said, can I have the breadstick to play with? And usually at home, we would always give him food on his plate for him to, to cut to pieces and to smell and just to be a part of the meal, basically. And all of a sudden, Adrian said, can I have another one? And we said, no, you already have one. And he said, not anymore. Yeah, I just ate it. I, it just happened. I have no idea why. I have no idea 
how it tasted. I don't remember. All I remember is my dad looked on his face when I told him. He was shocked and a little bit terrified. Will he be sick or is it get healed or how will this go? Just tiny, tiny amounts of watermelon that contains a lot of water was enough to, to make him very sick. So just the idea of him eating a breadstick, it was like, it was, it was unimaginable. So my husband and I started talking. Now what do we do? Do we take him to a hospital? And we thought, no, there's, it's no use. They don't know him here, you know? It's just too complicated to begin to explain everything. And we thought, well, we'll just have to observe. And he went to bed and everything was normal and we recognized something was different, but we didn't know what. The next morning I tiptoed into his room to see if he was still alive. And I, I looked over in his bed and Thomas came and stood next to me. And there he was sleeping, rosy cheeked, and, and he was just fine. I woke up with my mom over me and I asked, when is breakfast? And it was just amazing. His healing didn't come with a manual. We didn't know how to do this. But honestly, we just couldn't stop him. <laughs> he would eat everything. He would have burgers and fries and salads and, and pizzas and, and ice cream and everything. You know, it was just impossible to stop him. I had 12 years to catch up on. Within days from when he was healed, the muscles started growing back. He was changing right before our very eyes. When we came back to Norway, Adrian's doctors are saying, this cannot be explained medically. His physiotherapist says, this is a miracle from God. It just can't be anything else. It's a very strange feeling. When you have been through so many years, we're expecting him, he could die. And now he has the possibility to, to grow up, to get a family and to get... Everything is possible for him now. That is amazing. I remember the very moment I was in a car and and I realized that Adrian would have a future. And he had been healed for quite some time, but it, it just hit me that he will have a future. And I was just so grateful. You know, all those prayers that we th prayed throughout Adrian's life and his, his illness, I firmly believe that those kept him alive. He wasn't healed, but God kept him in his hand. I believe in the power of prayer and I believe in the power of God. I think nothing is impossible for God. Healing is on the Lord's heart. You know, that is, it is who He is. He's the creator, the life giver, the healer. I used to think that I know that God can heal, but I don't know if He wants to. And now I know He wants to. Man, I love this story for so many reasons, but I think it confronts so often our mindset about healing. Adrian said these words himself, I used to think that God can heal, but I didn't know if he wants to. And now I know he wants to. I bet you there's people watching today that that's exactly where you're at. You say, well, sure, God can heal, but I don't know if he wants to heal me. You know, something that I have learned in my life is that healing is something that God loves to do in community. I see it practiced even with Jesus. He moved in a community of people and so many of the miracles that took place took place in community. Um, let me read this verse for you in James, which I think emphasizes this. Is anyone among you sick? That could be physically sick, emotionally sick, sick relationally sick, spiritually sick. Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Now, let me tell you how this has worked out in my life. One of the primary, I would say, disciplines or spiritual practices in my life has been to move and follow Jesus with community. We have a small group that meets in our home 
honestly, for the last 100 years, okay, I'm not that old, but for many years, we've had small groups meet in our house. And just a few weeks ago, our small group met. It was a, just an ordinary night, nothing spectacular. And then we decided we're gonna ask for prayer requests. And one of the members of our group had severe pain uh, suffering severe pain in her back. And even doctors had said that the disc had degenerated to a place that she shouldn't expect any healing. She'd actually been told to take time off work and not be able to return for quite a, quite a long time. Well, we gathered around as a community and we laid hands on her back and we prayed. And do you know that very night she went home she started feeling better and better. She slept through the night. The next day she woke up, she had no pain. She went to the doctors and they re-examined her and they said, we don't understand, but everything looks like it's in place. Healing is for you and God loves to do it today. Won't you call us if you need healing? We wanna pray with you and encourage you and believe for healing with you. God loves to do it in community. Up next, a powerful message on gratitude. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, a passage probably familiar to most every one of us Christians, is the statement, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Commonly, such a passage is used by us preachers to encourage people to not be like the world, but to be different. And certainly that is legitimate. But the one thing most frequently missed is the word therefore. I beseech you therefore, brethren. I beseech you in light of what I've been writing. You know, there are three primary motivations that uh, all of us are compelled by. To either do what we do or, or to not do what we do not do. There is, first of all, the motivation of um, fear of consequences. Certainly no one gave us more detailed warnings about eternal damnation than the Son of God. But then there is the motivation of the promise of reward, the, the promise of blessing. So the fear of consequences, a legitimate motivator, and the promise of reward also legitimate. But the highest motivation of all is what I believe the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, draws our attention to here in this text. Highest motivation of all is love. Probably best associated with gratitude. The Apostle Paul wrote 11 chapters before that statement. And I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in light of the mercies of God, in light of all that God has done for us, in light of 11 chapters of the proclamation of all that has been done through Jesus Christ for us, what God has done, who God is in His greatness, His glory, the wonder of it all, that should be the thing that affects us, the thing that the Scripture calls us to, the action that is in fact our reasonable service is us giving ourselves to God, even our bodies, presenting that it's a living sacrifice, reasonable service. It's like the least we can do. We owe the God who gave us life. 
Hello, my name is Michelle, and I'm a prayer partner with 700 Club Canada. We have an amazing team waiting to pray with you, and we're available every day. We want to make it easy for you to connect with us. All you have to do is pick up your phone and call us at our toll-free number, 1-855-759-0700. And don't forget to let us know how God answered your prayers. We want to celebrate in your victories too. Our number again is 1-855-759-0700. We look forward to connecting with you today. You know, this whole time we've been talking about gratitude and we've seen some really powerful illustrations of why we need to be grateful. Absolutely, Brian. I think gratitude is one of the best pills you can take every day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't, I, I need to restart this practice, but it was Ann Voskamp's book, Thousand Blessings, that really got me into the practice of journaling three things a day I'm thankful for. And then, you know, maybe the list got longer, but it was a practice of gratitude. Uh. And that does shift your perspective and your expectations, don't you think? Well, it does. And um, I think especially right now as we're moving into 2020, a lot of times we're asking for things and we've got desires and hopes. But many times what God's waiting for is for us just to say thank you yeah. and be grateful for what we have, not necessarily just get something else. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes we begin to cry today about what we prayed for yesterday. And I really believe there is a, a need for us to move forward in this. Now, what we would really love for you to do is become a partner with us with the 700 Club Canada for just $20 a month or your best gift. We would love to get into your hands the, the success, the 10 keys for success. And Pat Robertson in this book teaches you how to win in family and finances and also in your faith life. And this is such a wonderful tool for you especially right now, and it would be an encouragement for us if you would reach out. 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. Yeah, that 10 Laws for Success is a new book by Pat, and I yeah. guarantee gratitude is listed in one of those laws, right? Yes. Well, Debbie is asking for, uh, for prayer for from Alberta. Mm -hmm. She said pray for her son, Braden, who needs healing in his legs. And Eugenie, she's in BC. She has a brother-in-law, and he's had a stroke and praying for healing. That's a touch and agree. Father, I lift up Debbie and I pray for her son, Brayden. We speak healing in Jesus' name over, her, over his legs. And I pray that community would rise up around him to pray with him because uh, we believe you heal in community in we Jesus' do. name. In Jesus' name. And Lord, for you, Jeannie, we believe that you also have inspired her to call the lines and to ask us to pray with those that are already praying. And as we agree with those that have prayed for this stroke to be completely restored, that there would be a restoration of health and vibrancy, we pray that for her and other strokes now in Jesus' name. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. Until next time, God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.